If you have your Bible, I want you to open it to 1 Chronicles chapter 17. 1 Chronicles chapter 17. And I am preaching this morning on Israel in prophecy. Israel in prophecy. When I talk about Israel, I want you to draw a parallel between natural Israel and spiritual Israel. There are two Israels. There's natural Israel and the Jewish people and the Holy Land, but the Bible also says there is spiritual Israel, which is the church, the body of Christ, you and I, the believers who have been engrafted into the heritage tree by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so every promise, everything that you read about the nation of Israel and the Jewish people that God promises, he has made even greater promises and covenant, a covenant that is even greater through Jesus Christ for you and I and for your family and my family. That's a powerful thing. So kind of rejoice on everything that I teach you today because it's not just natural Israel. God decrees the same blessings over spiritual Israel, his church, his people. Look with me in 1 Chronicles 17 and verse 21. This is David praying and he's pointing out some profound things about the nation and people of Israel, the Jewish people. And who is like you, verse 21, and who is like your people, Israel? See, we're not just called to love the holy land and the land of Israel, but the people of Israel. Who is like your people, Israel? The one nation on the earth whom God went to redeem for himself as a people. To make for yourself a name by great and awesome deeds, by driving out nations from before your people whom you redeemed from, a from e Egypt. God said, I am driving out people to put you in that land. You have made your people Israel your very own people forever. And your Lord and you, Lord, have become their God. The uniqueness of Israel, the thing that makes them different from every other nation, and I'm a proud American. I, I'm, I still stand. I still put my hand on my heart. I still believe in my country, and I love it. I'm a proud American, not ashamed to say I'm an American. <laughs> proud of it. Thank God for it. The greatest, greatest nation. But Israel is like no other nation because God set out to redeem it from other nations. Who is like your nation, Israel? The one nation God went to redeem for himself. In Exodus 19 and verse 6, God made promises to Moses. And he said, you shall be unto me a kingdom, a priest, a holy nation. You're not like the other nations in my mind. You are different. You are a kingdom, a priest. In Romans chapter 9, verse 4 and 5, the apostle Paul points out distinctive fe uh, features of the nation of Israel. When he says, who are Israelites? And these apply to not only natural Israel, but spiritual Israel, you and I, who are Israelites to whom pertain the adoption. We've been adopted. The glory, the covenants, the nation of Israel, the people of Israel, the Israelites, they have been adopted by God. God has put his glory upon them. They have the covenants that God made. So do you and I. They have been given the law, the, the commandments of God. They have the service of God, which is a reference to the priesthood has been given to them and all the promises of God. They've been given to the Israelites and to the land of Israel and the people of Israel. Paul was a theologian and a scholar. And he said, this is what this is how God sees them, and then he draws that comparison. Through the Jewish people, 
through the nation of Israel, the Savior of the world came. That cannot be said of any other nation. There is no other uh, race of people through which the Redeemer would come. When God, who is a spirit, put on human flesh, put on a physical body and came down to us, he said, I will do it through the lineage of Jewish flesh and bones. I will come in that flesh suit and I will come to a place called Israel and through a people called the Jews. In Revelation chapter 5, there is a scene in heaven, and it's so important that it's not just down here that he used the Jewish people and Jesus was Jewish, but even in heaven, it recognizes him. He said there was a scroll that was sealed with seven seals, and no one was able to open the book and break the seals. And then I heard a voice as the people were weeping, saying, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed to open the book and to break the seal. Notice the line of the tribe. In heaven, there is a Jewish redeemer, savior, and God. And he says, I want to be identified with the physical tribe I came from, the Israelite tribe of Judah. The word Jew is where we get Jew from. Duh. And there, and there the root of David has prevailed. That's pretty good. I didn't do that in the first service. That's a revelation right there. And, 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 and the root of David, see, he's saying, you can't separate me from the Jew. The root of David, go back into my lineage. And this is him speaking in heaven. So you, so you have to understand that not only was he a Jew when he was on earth, but he still is a Jew in heaven in his resurrected position. He's the line of the tribe of Judah and woe be to his enemies when he begins to roar because no one can fight the line of the tribe of Judah. There's an astounding verse that Jesus himself taught in John chapter four. He was speaking to the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. And he said, you worship and you don't know who you're worshiping. And he said in the verses before, your fathers worshiped in this mountain and they didn't know who they were looking for. And what he's saying is, but now I'm here. Five astounding words you must never forget. You should underline it in your Bible. For salvation is of the Jews. Jesus said that. Jesus was saying, I am Messiah and I would not be here if it were not for the Jewish people and it were not for the Holy Land. And when you understand that, where did our salvation come from? No Jews, no salvation. No Holy Land, no salvation. Why do we make such a big deal about it? Why do we stand with Israel? Why do we stand not just with the land of Israel, but with the people of Israel? Because salvation, breathtaking words, five, salvation, but salvation is of the Jews. No Jews, no salvation. Where did salvation come from? It came from a God who was spirit, who put on a flesh suit, and he chose that people. He can do what he wants to do with who he wants to do it with, any way he wants to do it, and he doesn't ask for your permission or mine. He said, I'm not choosing Americans. I'm not choosing British. I'm not choosing Africans. I'm not choosing Haitians. I'm not choosing... Um, uh, any 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 uh, Hispanic, I choose to come through this insignificant little people. And he even said in Deuteronomy, not because they were strong and mighty and powerful, because they were so little and so weak, I'm going to get glory. And there's the spiritual parallel. He didn't choose you because you had it all together. He didn't choose you because you were smart. He didn't choose you because he couldn't. He could have found somebody so much more worthy.
worthy than you, but he said, I choose you, and when I choose you, I can use you, and I don't ask other people's permission. Don't care who likes you, who doesn't like you. I'll raise you up, and I'll protect you, and I'll bless you, and I'll prosper you, and I'll use you. Thanks be unto God, he chose us. We did not choose him. Clap your hands and praise him for that. Salvation is of the Jews means my whole spiritual inheritance. I owe to one nation, Israel, and one people, the Jewish people, because they gave me my Jewish Messiah. I know all glory, honor, and praise goes to Jesus, but Jesus said, and the apostle Paul said, you cannot curse those people. The Bible puts it like this. Remember this verse. You can always be real spiritual and quote this verse. One, two, three. Everybody say one, two, three. In Genesis 12, one, two, and verse three, I will bless those who bless you, Israel, and I will curse those who curse you. That's why I don't want nothing to do with uh, smarty little young people out in the streets cursing Israel, cursing anti-Semitic. It is wrong on the campuses. It is wrong. I'm going to stand in the pulpit as long as I got the microphone. And I'm going to say you're as wrong as you can be. If you curse that nation, God will curse you. God will curse your family. God will curse this nation. And if we bless that nation, God will bless you, will bless your family, and he will bless your nation. I say God bless America and God bless Israel. Does that mean we don't love Palestinians? Absolutely not. Does that mean God doesn't love Palestinians? Absolutely not. Should we weep? Should we cry? Should we pray for the Palestinians 100% just like we do everybody else? But what do we do when the whole world is trying to wipe out that nation and that race? You see, the reason the devil hates them so much is because he knows Jesus is coming back and he can't come back if the Jews are not in the land called Israel and in a city called Jerusalem. So everything he's doing is trying to get the whole world to wipe them out so Jesus can't come. But he who... Oh, I feel like preaching. But he who watches over Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. And I promise you, nobody's going to move them out of that land. I don't care who they are. I don't care how powerful, how rich, how much money, how much prestige. You can't fight with God. Your arms are too short to box with God. And Hamas will pass away. And Hezbollah will pass away. And every hater of that nation will pass away, but his kingdom will reign forever. Somebody give God a praise. Hallelujah. Without that nation, without the Jewish people, there would be no apostles. No Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. No Apostle Paul. There would be no patriarchs. There would be no Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Isaiah, Daniel, Ezekiel. Without that group and that nation, there would be no Bible. There would be no Ten Commandments. There would be no prophets. And there would be no Savior. And there would be no salvation for your soul. Am I a little one-sided about it? Yeah, because the Bible is one-sided about it. And he said, don't ever let the branches start thinking that they're more important than the roots. You, the roots, the branches need the roots and the roots need the branches. They don't know us yet. They don't know our Messiah yet. They're blinded. But one of these days, the eyes are going to open. And just like we need our roots. And you say, what are you talking about? Romans chapter 11. I thought you were going to ask that. <laughs> Romans chapter 11 says that the roots, that the branches can't say the church, the New Testament, New Covenant believers can't say, I don't need the roots. Well, what are the roots? That's Judaism. There it is. No, keep going. The next, you still haven't found the one I'm wanting. 
So are the branches. Maybe it's the next one. But the, it goes on to say, mm, I'll find it. Oh, I'm going to, they can edit this, but I'm going to fix this right now. I feel this thing. Can you get what I'm wanting? I promise it's in, Ro in Re Romans chapter 11. Everybody say they're doing great. There you go. So if some of the branches were broken off and you kind of got ahead of it, I know this book. <laughs> Keep going down. Keep going down. Go, 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 go back to that. Go to the next one. Uh, what, what number? 19. They said 19. Verse 19. 19. The branches were broken off that's, and, and engrafted. That's not, I need to read it out of my Bible. <laughs> Y'all going to just have to wait. Tick tock, tick tock. All right, here it is. I got it. Verse 18. Do not boast against the branches. If you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. That's exactly right. But do not boast. Do not say, we don't need the Jews and we don't need the Holy Land. It's just enough. This junk has crept into the modern day church. We don't need our roots. We don't need the Holy Land. It's not like any other land. It is not just another race of people on the earth. God said, I have an everlasting covenant with the Jewish people and with that land. And he said, if you curse them, you curse me. If you bless them, you bless me. All of our spiritual blessings come from one nation the nation of Israel, and one group of people, the Jewish people. To not acknowledge that is anti-Christian. We owe our salvation to the Jews, to the Messiah that they gave us in physical form who died on a cross and shed his precious blood. His name is Jesus. Israel is unique in that their whole history is foretold in prophecy. God gave 16 prophecies about the nation of Israel. It was foretold and prophesied that they would go into slavery in Egypt. And it was also foretold that they would be delivered with wealth from Egypt. It happened just like God said. They, it was prophesied that they would possess the land of Canaan. It was prophesied that they would then turn to idolatry. It was prophesied that God would establish a temple in Jerusalem, and it happened just like it was prophesied. It was prophesied that, Babel, that the Babylonians would invade, and Nebuchadnezzar and his armies would destroy the temple, and it happened just like the temple that Solomon built. It was destroyed. The second time... It was prophesied even by Jesus that Herod's temple would be destroyed, not a stone left. And that happened just like God said. It was prophesied that Israel would be scattered among the nations and they would not be in, in the Holy Land or have a, a nation for many, many generations. It was prophesied that they would be persecuted by the Gentiles and it was prophesied that God would regather all nations. Now, there are, there are 16 prophecies about the nation of Israel and 13 of those predictions that I just gave you have already been fulfilled. That's an 81% fulfillment of Scripture. And there are only three left to be fulfilled. One is that there will be a gathering of all nations to war against Israel. And you're seeing the beginnings of that even in the news as we speak. There will come an invasion from the north. That's Russia, Gog and Magog and, and, and the kings and Iran, Persia. These are the major, this isn't just something that you're making up right now. People have been saying this and seeing this in scripture. Iran, China and Russia, keep your eye. They are behind and are out to destroy with all of the nations around Israel, that little slice of real estate that's the size of New Jer the state of New Jersey. 16 have been, 16 prophecies and 13 out of 16 have been fulfilled. A book that predicts 13 right and three not yet have happened, you should take it very, very serious. 
God's plan for Israel is found when he said in Jeremiah, I will bring them back from captivity. I will bring them into the land of their fathers. They shall possess it in the latter days. The return of the Jews from the land uh, all over the world, God said, I'll bring them back from captivity. I'll bring them back and there'll be a generation that will possess the land. They'll possess it and they'll never be uprooted again. That happened in May 14, 1948. As I preached a few weeks ago, the reestablishment of the nation of Israel. I want you to understand how prophetic and how far bigger than the deliverance of the children of Israel out of Egypt. Bigger than that is a prophecy concerning Israel that has happened in your generation. In 1948, are there any people who were alive in 1948 or born in 48 or before it? Raise your hand. I want to see your hand. There's a lot of hands. There's more hands in this service than I've seen in a lot of services. But the point is, Jesus said, that generation will not pass away. When you see Israel reborn, Matthew 24, when you see the fig tree reborn, know that the time is near. My hand is on the door and this generation shall not pass away. Israel is 75 years old, you're running out of time to get right. You're, you're running out of time to be ready for the rapture. You're running out of time to not be left behind for the Antichrist and all that is coming. The great tribulation is what the Bible calls. The earth will go through tribulation like it has never seen. You're just seeing the tremors of it. When you understand that, God said, I will take from all nations and I'll bring you into your own land, Israel. God said, I will take from all nations and I'll give you the land and you'll drive them out and I'll give you the land. And I'm sorry, God can do what he wants, when he wants, to who he wants, and he doesn't have to ask permission. And you ought to rejoice because when God is for you, who can stand against you? When God says you can have it, I don't care how many people try to close the door, God says I open doors no man can shut. And I shut doors and no enemy enemy can get in. And when the enemy comes in like a flood, God raises up a standard because we are spiritual Israel. Shout if you believe he's a God who can protect his own people. Hallelujah. He said in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 11 and 12, it'll come to pass in that day that I, the Lord, shall set my hand again a second time to recover the remnant of his people. The first time was after Babylonian captivity. They went back. But the second time was 1948. And God said, my hand will make this happen a second time. And once they go back the second time, they will never, ever be scattered and leave that land again. The second regathering from all over the world and then he goes on to say, and I will set up a banner for the nations. Isn't that amazing? That's in reference to Isaiah 66, a nation shall be born in a day. And God said, I'm going to set up a banner for the nation. You know what the banner is? The, nation, the flag of Israel, the star of David. God said, they're going to know. And, and you know, for the nations, that's a reference to the United Nations. And he said, I'm going to, that the United Nations, he's given us hints that the United Nations will declare in 48 after World War II and the Holocaust, those people need, they need their own land. And they raised the banner in 1948, May the 14th in Israel. And that is the banner. And God said, that banner I'm raising, not because they're great, not because they're better than any other people, but I'm going to get glory out of them. They're going to know that I am their God and that the whole world and the nations of the world will know by their very existence that I am God. The banner of the nations, it's God's banner. That banner says, I give to your descendants this land. And God keeps his covenant. When you, when you look at how powerful Israel is now, it's a miracle of God. Half of the resolutions the UN has passed, over half 
are negative about Israel, and yet they continue to grow and prosper. They're surrounded with enemies, yet they continue to grow and exist and prosper. Jesus, in Matthew 23, in his farewell speech to Jerusalem, he said, I, I'm weeping over Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who stoned the prophets and, 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 you, and you, uh, you killed and and I'm weeping, how often I would have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her chicks, but you were not willing. But I don't want you to think that God's through with them because the apostle Paul answers that question in the book of Romans in the, in the 10th and 11th and 12th chapter. He says, has God cast away Israel? Is God done with Israel? He said, I won't, I won't come again. I won't speak to you. I won't come back to you. You're going to go through. It even says these words are in the book of Romans. Paul said they are blinded. The Jewish people, how can they see and live in the Holy Land and not see Messiah Jesus? They don't believe in Jesus. Jewish people do not believe Jesus is God. They do not believe it. They do not receive him. Why? Because their eyes are blinded. And the Bible that God, Paul used that word, but he said, I won't come again. You will not see me anymore until I hear you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. What is that about? That's, that's when he's coming back. Now there's the rapture. That will happen before all of this happens. And then the great tribulation. And at the end of the great tribulation, Jesus Christ is coming back on a white horse and he's bringing all of us with him. And I want to read it. I want you to see it. And in that moment, when they see him, when they see him and he comes down to earth and they see his wounds, this is what will happen in Zechariah 12 in verse 10. And I will pour out on the house of Israel the spirit of grace and supplication, and they will look on me whom they have pierced or crucified. And they will mourn for him as one who mourns for his only son. They're gonna, the word mourn means repent. They're going to cry out. They're going to realize, oh my God, he was the one. Jesus is Messiah. He is our Messiah. He is the one because he was wounded for our transgressions and pierced for our iniquities. They're going to, the, the scales are going to come off and thousands and hundreds of thousands Thousands of Jewish people will be converted and believe in Jesus Christ and bow their knees. It's going to happen. He said, they'll look on me whom they pierced and they'll repent. And there will be great repentance going on. Now, let me, let me show you where, where I'm headed now in the closing time that we have. I have five minutes and I'm going to take it. There is the reestablishment of Jerusalem. It's already happened. There is the return of Jesus Christ. It's going to happen. And there is the revelation of Jesus Christ for the Jewish people. They are the three that have yet to happen. What the devil fears the most is the return of Jesus Christ. The Jews must be in Jerusalem. For Jesus Christ to come back. The Jews must be there in the Holy Land. And this is why Satan is stirring up the nations of the world. To hate that land and hate that people. And now it's even becoming almost like it was in World War II. Where you can say whatever you want to say. Anti-Semitism is very, very, very much on the move and accepted. Why? Why? Because Jesus must come back when the Jews are in Jerusalem and have the Holy Land. And Satan knows that. He wants to wipe them off the face of the earth. God, help the USA not to be on the wrong side. I want to give you this verse. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6 and 7. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure. Above all the peoples of the face of the earth, that's the parallel of the Christian too. A special treasure above all the peoples of the earth. Verse 7, the Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you, Israel, 
Jewish people and the church because you were more in number than any other people. For you were the least of all the people. I want you to understand that God doesn't love us because we're valuable. We're valuable because he loves us. And he says, you're a special people. And I conclude with this. Israel was God created, God decreed, God loved, God called, God elected, and God protected. Israel is, has a special purpose, and that is to bring Messiah to the world. The church has a purpose to bring Messiah, Jesus, to the world. Israel is under special protection, according to Jeremiah 31 and verse 35. God says you would have to destroy the sun, the moon, and the stars. You would have to destroy all the one who gives the light of day. The God of the armies of heaven says if you can destroy the stars and the light and the sea and wipe it all out, then you can attack and defeat Israel once I put them back in that land a second time. What he's saying is they're under special protection. And the power that regulates the sun, the moon, and the stars. You can no more destroy Israel than you can destroy the universe. There are special people with a special purpose, with a special protection. And lastly, it is a special place. Israel is a special place. And God put his people in that special place. And God, out of all of the whole earth, said, I choose that place called Israel. And he called it my holy land. And then he said, I choose that city in that land, my holy city, Jerusalem. And then he said, I choose that one hill in that city that's in that land. And that's the same hill that Abraham offered Isaac. That's the same hill that Solomon built the first temple. And that is the same hill that Jesus will come back and possess. And he will rule and reign for a 1,000 year millennium. And then the great white throne judgment. Let me conclude with this. What is going to happen next is the rapture of the church. And then there will come on the scene, standing in the shadows of history, is a man known as the Antichrist. Revelation chapter 12 and 13 gives. And I, I just want to I want to take my time and I'm going to do this because I want to do it. In Revelation chapter 12, and I want to put up verse 1, I saw a dragon. And let me do it. I saw a dragon. He said in verse 1, there appeared a woman clothed. Everybody say a woman. That woman is the nation of Israel. Why, how do you know that? Verse 2, she was with child and she was in labor. She was bringing Messiah. Israel is the woman. The baby is Messiah. Verse 3, and I saw a red dragon. And he wanted, it goes on to say, he wanted to devour that child. Now, what I want to point out to you is simply this. He wanted to devour that child. And verse 13, when the dragon saw that the woman gave, gave birth to the child, notice the words. He persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. Who is the woman? Israel the nation of Israel, the Jewish people. And what is the dragon doing? Ever since that nation brought Messiah, they have been persecuted. Look at it again in verse 17. And the dragon was enraged with the woman. Who's the woman? Israel. Israel. And he went to make war. Notice the specific, with the rest of her offspring. Her descendants. Do you understand that what you're watching on the news is revelation being unfolded right in front of your eyes? I really gonna mess with you now. Okay. And what happens is pretty amazing. Because he says, 
the dragons enraged. And then verse, the next part of the verse in chapter 13, he begins to describe the Antichrist ultimately. The Antichrist comes on the scene out of seething seas, unrest, out of control, social agitation, like a sea. He said, I saw this beast come out. The beast, he's called the man of sin. He's called the son of perdition, the little horn. And out of this social multitudes of people, nations, social agitation comes the rise in Revelation 13 and 1 of the beast, the Antichrist. His attributes are described as the father is the drag, uh, his father is the dragon, his family is the collective evil of world empires, his fortune is the power and authority of Satan. The beast is Satan's superman. His seductive appeal is described in Revelation 13. His appearance will, will amaze the world. What will happen is according to Revelation 13, in our verse three, he will be mortally wounded in his head and he will be healed from that. Literally what will take place is he will look like he's dead and have a wound and Satan, because he had to have a snake in the garden, he cannot legally come as a spirit. He has to possess a body and Satan in that moment will step into his body and he will be, he will be, the antichrist will be Satan in skin. And the world will wonder after him, the scripture said. They'll marvel. They'll wonder after this wound. After He will literally be possessed and have a physical, just like a mockery of the, of the incarnation of Christ through Mary. He will come into the earth in that moment and take possession of that body that is known as the Antichrist. And the world will marvel at the signs and the wonders. And out of that will come enforced worship. It goes on to say, I believe it will be the spirit of Islam and you either bow because this antichrist is anti-Christ and is anti-Semitic and is anti-Christian and is anti-Bible. Lastly, he will control the wealth. And how will this happen? In verse 16, in verse 16 of Revelation 13, he said, he said, and he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive the mark in their right hand or their foreheads. Next verse. That no one can buy or sell except one receive the mark in the name of the beast and the number of his name. Here is the wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man. His number is 666. The only question left now is, will you be here for that? You can be saved during the great tribulation, but it'll cost you your life. And you cannot take the mark of the beast or you won't be able to buy and sell and have food. You'll have to hide. And you're either following the lamb or you're going to follow the beast. And he says in that same sequence of Revelation 12, 13, 14, and whosoever's name was not found in the book of life. There will come the great judgment, great white throne judgment, and I won't be there, and I hope none of you under the sound of my voice and listening to me will be there because I settled out of court. I settled it in an altar in Rocky Mount, North Carolina. And I don't have to plead my case. I'll plead the blood. And the judge will come down with a hammer and say, worthy is the lamb. He's clean. Open the pearly gates and let him in to a city where there'll never be a tear, pain, sorrow, death. What about you? What about you? Are you ready for the coming, the imminent? return of Jesus Christ. All those prophecies have happened and there are just a handful that are left. One of them is the rapture of the church. 
And in an hour you think not, he's coming. Be ready. I'm going to ask you not to move in and out. Just stand to your feet, bow your heads at every campus. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you would say, Pastor Jensen, I need to be ready. I need to repent. I need to follow the Lamb. I need to give my heart to Jesus Christ today. Pray for me. I want to be washed. I want to be cleansed. I want eternal life. I want to know joy unspeakable and full of glory. And boy, I need to conclude this thing soon on preaching on heaven. Because you've heard all the bad news, but we cannot even imagine the good that God has laid up for his own. Oh, my God. Oh, my Lord. Eyes haven't seen and ears haven't heard. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. Don't die and go to hell. Don't be left behind. Be ready. Pastor, I want to be ready. I want to get right with God. If that's you, boldly raise your hand right where you're standing. I want the Christians to pray right now. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand. Raise it unashamed. High, high. That's it. That's it. All over the room at every campus. If the Lord is speaking to you and I see so many hands, just get out of your seat and come down and stand at the front of the building. We want you to come forward. We still believe. I don't know. I still, I still believe it takes something. It breaks something off of you when you step out by faith and say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of Jesus. Here they come. Clap your hands, church. They're getting ready. They're getting ready. And in the last days, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And that's what's happening. Come on, come on, come on. Don't resist it. Don't resist him. Don't say another day. Don't say he delays his coming. I've got plenty of time. Come this morning. If the Spirit is drawing you, come, come, come. The Spirit says come. Beautiful, beautiful. Come on, they're still coming. Clap your hands, church. This is more important than anything. This is more important than anything. Precious souls. Precious souls. Come on, come on, come on, come home to Jesus. Come home, you've been running too long. You know it's real, you know you, you know you need to get right this morning. Don't put it off another service. Don't put it off another day. Come on, bless you. God bless you, son. God bless you, son. Come on, come on, that's somebody's son. That's somebody's daughter. That's somebody's grandchild. That's somebody's husband. That's somebody's wife. That's somebody's child. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Come on, come on, come on. You know you need to walk down that aisle. You know you need to humble yourself. You know you need Jesus like you've never needed him before. And the reason you're here, listen to me carefully. The reason you walk down that aisle is because the Holy Spirit dealt with you and God spoke to you. If you never hear him again, he spoke to you this morning. And he said, I love you. I'll save you. I'll redeem you. I have a purpose and a plan. I'll protect you. I'll keep you. Just like I keep Israel, I'll keep you. I'll keep you. So right now, we're going to pray this prayer. And I want everybody in the room at every campus to pray it with me. Pray out loud. And as I... Pray it, I speak it over your families that are in the grill and in our stages at every campus. We have pictures of families that we started during the fast this year. God save our families. This ought to give you a burden for the lost loved ones and friends that don't know Jesus. This ought to give you a move in your heart to say, tell somebody about Jesus. Now raise your hand high all over the room and down front pray this prayer. Say, Lord Jesus, I give you my life. I believe that you, Jesus, are the Savior of the world. You have a plan. You're a great God of mercy and goodness. And I receive you 
as my Savior. You died. You carried the cross. You bled and died for me. And you rose again to give me eternal life and the hope of heaven. And I receive it right now. By faith, write my name in the book of life. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' mighty name, I am a child of God. Praise Him and give Him all the glory. If you prayed that prayer, I want you to go straight back and I want you to go to, there's a booth back there called Next Steps and get signed up for water baptism and I'm gonna baptize you, son. I'm gonna baptize you in water. You're gonna tell your testimony of what Jesus, there's talents and gifts in you that the kingdom of God is gonna use for his glory. Are you ready? I'm ready. My prayers even so come Lord Jesus. Raise your hand and receive the blessing. Thank you for giving. Thank you for tithing. Thank you for giving offerings. Thank you for supporting this work around the globe. Now receive. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you. May the Lord be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you. And may he give you peace. In Jesus' mighty name. We love you so much. Thank you for worshiping with us. Tonight at 5 o'clock, Perry Stone will cap off the signs of the times. And Lord, have mercy. There's no telling what God's going to do. I feel it building already. I really do. I feel like all heaven's going to hit this place tonight. Don't miss it. Call a friend. Share a miracle. Bring a friend. Share a miracle. We love you. God bless you.